studied for years. Yeah, okay, got got your got it's, we've just had we've just popped on the recording there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So um so let's start with with VCOD because that is the kind of hot hot topic uh, right about now, you know. I think a lot of people uh, it stirred up a lot of emotions with people um around you know those who are, who are vaccinated and uh, or have lost people um during this this couple of years this this past two years you know um so it's, it's a very emotional um it's been a very emotional time and the subject is very emotional as to whether you have a vaccine or not whether you take the vaccine or not um and um when um healthcare staff were asked to to take the vaccine i thought that that was quite reasonable and you know quite I thought it was quite fair and, and quite acceptable absolutely but then the issue started to come up when they when they didn't um when some didn't want to take the vaccine and that's when I started to see some conflicts in in opinions and it kind of really opened up my eyes to how complex this this issue is and I think it's because it's so heavily based on emotion there's so much emotion entangled in it so when the mandatory vaccination came about, um, I thought that that was, well, I kind of had mixed feelings about it myself because at the same time we were hearing about other European countries or other countries around the world, should I say, not just Europe, because we're not Europe anymore, are we? <laughs> Technically. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so um, I was hearing, you know, that it was kind of twinned with news, you know, from around the world, you know, that there were other countries that were um, that were imposing or enforcing um, um, mandatory vaccinations. And we were seeing kind of the, the, what was happening in those countries, public opinion, if there were marches and if there were fight back, we were seeing that if, if it was giving, if it was provide, pushing up other issues, we were seeing that, so and we had an idea that we may be heading for that same kind of ruling in this country. So it was a very kind of surreal time. But pushing back now to my point, um, so yeah, it was quite em emotional for me to see the, the nurses and the, the, cl the clinical staff, because it wasn't just nurses, nurses, consultants, doctors, tech, um, therapists, um, administrative staff, you know, people, people that work in healthcare throwing down their uniforms and being prepared to lose their jobs rather than take the vaccine. And these, some of these people have studied, most of these people have studied for four, five, six, seven years to do this profession. Yeah, they've studied medicine, you know, those that, those that are on, on, on the medical side. They've studied the, the, uh, the, the, the whole clinic, clinical side, you know, and it's no easy feat. You know, they've got name, numbers behind, sorry, letters behind them, their name, Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science, Master's degrees, and all these huge educational processes that they've been through for the profession that they love. But they were willing to turn their back on that because they didn't want to take the vaccine and they didn't want to be forced to take it. Now, what troubled me was the fact that those guys know more about medicine than I do. They, and, they, and they no doubt have friends and colleagues that 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 would that they can discuss the 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 intricacies of the whole vaccination thing with in in conversations that I wouldn't miss I couldn't understand if I was sat in a room with them the, the terminologies and stuff that they'd be using so so they have like a like a like a you know the bat phone and Batman and Robin you know the red line yeah they got they've got that 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 straight direct link to some very important information i would think yeah um and whilst we've got the government on one hand informed by their scientists that are telling us the people to do one thing you know we've also got these people who are inside the the healthcare system yeah as professionals experts in their field yeah and some of them find it are so passionate about not taking the vaccine that they're prepared to lose their job. I found that quite really moving, really moving, and it and it really did open my, up my eyes to 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 this situation that then came about, which was the what they're calling VCOD, vaccination as a condition of deployment, VCOD. 
Um, and um, the fact that these, these staff, healthcare staff, were being told that they must be vaccinated, fully vaccinated, that's two jabs and perhaps the booster, by the 1st of February, has to start on the 1st of February, and, and it must complete by the 31st of March. Yeah. And and if that if they weren't going to do that, then then they then they were then they could lose their jobs. And a lot of them would lose their jobs because there would be no like for like role for them to go to. So deployment can only happen. You can only be deployed into another job within your company or the same job that you've been doing in another department. You can only be deployed to that job if it actually exists, if there's a vacancy for it. So there were many staff that were actually that, that actually lost their job and and have not have had to leave their trust. And um, that really took me. Um, I, I was quite emotional about that. So yeah, I'm very interested to hear, interested to hear Rudy um, about the update with the with this situation and. Um, and what's happened from your side, what your experience of it has been, and of course, what you know about where, where we go from here. Because as we know, the government did turn around their decision to, to, to mandate or to make it mandatory for all healthcare staff to be fu uh, fully vaccinated in order to, to, to work on the premises. Now, I must just add that it's not just the clinical staff. This is all NHS staff whether you're an administrator or a cleaner or a porter, you were being told that you had to, you had to have the vaccine or you would risk deployment and losing your job. OK, and the reason and, and the and the um, the reason that they gave for for it being all staff and not and not um, uh, just clinical staff and staff that work on wards is that because you're in a hospital setting, you will at some point you know, even if you're an administrator or you're, you know, and you work in an office, you will go to the, to the loo and you will go to the, to the canteen and you will pop to the shop, you know, and you will go in and out of the hospital. And that way you will pass people who are not in good health. Yes. And those people who are not in good health, yeah, are the patients. And if you have COVID, then you are putting those patients at risk. So that's why they say, that's why they said everybody, it doesn't matter if you're clinical or not. So, um, and that was another eye opener for me. So Rudy, please go ahead. I think I've spoken for long enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, you, you're right. Uh, with some of, some of your observations. So just before um, I, I answer some of the key points, just just to say that um, I've been running um, confidential workforce well-being dialogues, as they're called, and, and this is with individual staff from, from all all backgrounds in terms of their um their their work i'm picking up some background information noise there so this, this so this is um has been a, quite a big concern to staff because of um as you indicated uh people do have their their different uh opinions as it relates to the um the 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 compulsory or the mandatory uh vaccine uh as a condition of employment of deployment i should say which obviously does translate into um uh potential issues of employment mm -hmm. i think if you remember going back a couple of years we we were talking about section 44 as it related to um, uh, the staff staff, empl staff employment, but to really take you onto the work that I I've really been doing uh, with the confidential dialogues, um, I I've kind of put things the dialogues into into three or four areas, 
Now, you will have heard me say many times that the community is the workforce and the workforce is the community. And this was really has been important as we've run through our, our dialogues. And so through these Haringey Community Wellness Dialogues that we will be having once again for the next uh, few weeks, it's about our community being informed, reassured, so that they can make their choice. So the the, the workforce um, well-being dialogues. I, I've kind of uh, uh, noticed that there are four basic themes relating to this, and, and and this is the broader, as I said, well-being, and it relates to performance as well. So it's about spiritual mindset. Uh, mental well-being, the, the, what we call moral distress, and also trust, trust and confidence. And that's trust and confidence in terms of the workforce within the system that they're working in. And also, of course, the public being confident in the workforce and using the, 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 the services. And that's why we talk about community as the workforce, workforce is the community. And the COVID has really demonstrated, demonstrated to us that we have to think about both interests. So um, the, the government's position um, originally was that um, the vaccination was the best way to keep vulnerable people safe. And that was from the Delta virus at the time on the basis that if you are not infected, you cannot infect someone else. So that was the policy direction, or that was the policy. If you are not infected, you cannot in fact infect someone else because um, the workforce were dealing with vulnerable people, members of all communities, including our own, of course. And if you go back to 2020, the original community transmission from from the health sector into communities due to lack of the original PPE and actually understanding how the, the vaccine was being transmitted um, that brought a lot of um, concern to all communities. So you can see some of the thinking that uh, went into that policy. Then of course the government felt that the there was a balance between this risk and felt well there will there would always be some people who would not uh who would who would remain unvaccinated as their choice and then and some as you indicated earlier on be willing to to walk away from their jobs in health and care, particularly, you know, health and social care. But, um, and of course, all of that policy was really driven under the, the Delta, um, when Delta was the biggest concern. And um, so they felt that vaccination as a condition of deployment uh, really, outweighed the risks to the workforce. So that was the reason that they would drive that forward. And of course, as, as you've indicated, um, that there was substantial pushback uh, from that, even though um, I've still the majority, the vast majority of the workforce have been vaccinated. But given given the country's current condition in terms of um, jobs and and such a high level of, I think at one point they were saying 77,000 or 80,000 people were at risk of um, having to, to lose their jobs. Obviously that would have a massive impact on the provision of of services. So the government also indicated that Omicron was not as um, 
uh, of great concern compared to the Delta. And now actually was the time to, for us to really start to, to be living with, with, with the virus and organizing our lives accordingly. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, can, so I just, can, can I add something, Rudy? Yeah. Could I add something? Is that okay? Just quickly. Um, the thing is, the thing that that one one of the things about the the risk that that they were saying that they they were they felt was um, too high, you know, um, and the reason why they wanted to enforce the mandatory vaccinations. The health, although I do agree that that it was a, a consideration that was that was put on the table from, from when Delta was ravaging the world. We'll talk about the nation then, as we're talking about the NHS, National Health Service. Um, um, the NHS for Omicron, well, and for from, from probably late in the Delta um, pandemic, um, had made sure that every trust, every healthcare setting had, um, enough um, test kits for staff and staff were told to test every day yeah as far as I understand it yeah from from colleagues who, who are currently working in the healthcare sector um, they have told me that um, that they were given loads of test kits and they're off each office was given loads of test kits to just stay in the office and people were asked to check on it themselves daily before they come to work yeah and whilst at work yeah especially if they went into uh, clinical areas uh, wards or or anywhere like that yeah where you're, there were you're talking about the, the lfts now the, the the yeah the lateral flow test lateral yeah flow mm -hmm. test. yeah okay. yeah which is the takes about half an hour maybe 20 minutes or so to do that yeah. test and it gives yeah gives you a result whether you are negative or positive or if it comes back with with the two lines with two lines on it then then that is unclear so you have to test again if you get if you were to get both lines show up but if you had just one line under the c under clear then then, then you then you were clear and if you had one line under the t then then you, then you were um then you tested positive yeah, yeah but if you had two lines or if the two lines were slightly faded or one line was clear or one line was faded, you were told you had to test again because yeah. they needed a clear result I, either way. I, and that I, was every every healthcare worker was told to test every single day. Yeah. So if that wasn't enough for them to, 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 to know that staff were clear or not, I don't understand what, actually, I don't understand why that wouldn't have been enough. Yeah. Why that wasn't enough. I, I guess there, there's, there's a compliance issue and there's a cost issue, as we now know, with, re with relation to this kind of, um, this kind of action, I would, I would imagine. Time, cost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. these are considerations from a policy perspective, but yeah, I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, because there yeah. was daily testing. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, the daily testing. Because what the government had said as well that nineteen out of twenty NHS workers have, you know, did take have had the vaccine. So of course, that still left a significant amount of unvaccinated um, uh, staff. Right. Mm -hmm. So so. Um, so on the, I think it was the 31st of January then, um, the government decided to, to revoke, um, to, re, to revoke that particular order and, and to review the, the current guidance on vaccinations as it related to um, uh, NHS staff. However, however, I, I don't think the actual policy direction has changed. It, it'll, I think um, when you listen carefully to the actual announcement, it's thing, things will be done in a different way because um, what's now happened, the government, or I should say 
the Department of Health and Social Care has written to professional regulators operating across health to ask them to urgently review current guidance to registrants on vaccines, including COVID-19, to emphasize their professional responsibilities in this respect. And of course, register- What does that mean? So registrants mean? being, you know, if you're, if you're a nurse or a doctor or other types of health professionals, you'll, you'll be registered maybe with a, um, uh, one of the regular regulators, for example, the nursing and midwifery council. Um, and I see, the, I the see. Body, the body for doctors, which, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, is it the GMC general medical? That's right. Council. Yeah, that that's gives them. So, yeah, that the, gives them their actual medical yeah, code, their yeah, membership to, yeah, to so say that was, they have a license to practice. Exactly. The GMC. So, yeah. Whoever, yeah. So whoever would be, you know, your license to pr practice, and know that, no doubt, that would be linked, of course, with the royal colleges as well, and then, then the NHS is to is to review its policies on hiring of new staff and deployment of existing staff taking into account their vaccination status so that can make, that's quite a, a a wide range of uh decisions that can be taken uh on an individual basis as a staff have those uh dialogues with their managers and of course uh tr trusts have their own uh, local policies and guidelines as part of the um, uh, employment uh, in, in their locations and then and then there's another area there's um, the department itself it's code of practice which which also applies to all care quality commission registered providers of health care so the care the cqc as it's called the care quality commission so i guess when they're doing their visits that will be an area of focus to, as, as well in terms of uh, uh staff and the, and vaccination I, I would guess because uh the code of practice and that's something that we would have to wait to see uh what is the department's code of practice as it relates to Care Quality Commission, at, mm -hmm. it, sorry, the Care Quality Commissioned Registered Providers. So if you're an NHS Trust or if you're a care home, there will be certain codes of practice as part of the inspection regime as well. So that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that we've yet to see what that update uh or what does that actually mean yeah 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 what I mean yes yes and then also as you of course in all of these uh locations where there are patients vulnerable patients and staff and community uh um is will be they're looking again at strengthening the requirements in relation to covid including the latest advice on infection protection control and so you know when it comes to infection protection control there's quite a lot of say that they have in terms of keeping a, a particular area safe as you know when it comes to infections protection control so just those four areas i've kind of touched on just tells you that the the direction um, it's really still the same so there's still some some dialogues to be had with staff and their and their, and their, and their management so it's watch this space for the moment isn't it but the most important thing that that deadline of um that, that, so i guess what's really been revoked in terms of interpreting the policy I would say is it's the deadline has been the deadline the date the deadline date has been re revoked, but the overall policy direction for implementation 
is still there on the basis that that vaccination is on all the science that the government has is that vaccination is the is the best way to keep vulnerable people to keep vulnerable people safe. Safe, yeah. And and that um, if you're not infected, you cannot infect someone else. So, yeah, sure, but, sure. So, but that you see yeah. that second bit. If you're not infected, then you can't infect someone else. Uh, mm. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, but even those those that are vaccinated can still get the 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 the, the, the virus. They can still force it. They you know, with, with, they can, can. Still get, get COVID. They, and, they they, can. And, and, and in that state, they can still pass it on. So even mm. getting vaccinated, double, triple vaccinated, boosted, yada yada yada, you can still get the vaccine, get get the virus. You know, you could catch it at work whilst you're treating somebody, even though you're vaccinated. But, but the part you can't miss miss out on that in the um, yes, you can get it, but the if you've been vaccinated, it's less likely to be as uh, in 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 terms of hospitalisation and some of the other harshness of the of that condition. So that that's the point that we can't we can't miss out. And then what links to that is that if there's less hospital hospitalization, there's less pressure on the health service itself in terms of serving the public. So we still always have to look at the greater good of public health, even though it's a challenge to individual decision making. So, so there's always that aspect to, to be added to that. And I think that I think that that's a very good um, aspect because it's very real. But equally, uh, as I said before, if you are fully vaccinated, you can still fall ill, and you can still and now uh, and you can still pass on. You can still catch the virus, and you can still pass it on, even if you are double, triple vaccinated. The severity, I think, is neither here nor there because the vax the but the virus itself is is reducing in its in its strength because of, it, of its mutation um and that's that's just what happens you're, you're, with viruses the, as i understand you're it getting into the science now i, I wouldn't really i wouldn't get to that deep into mm, no, i don't know if it's the science but, i think but, it's just i think that's just right, let's, the standard all right let's just say i understand what my point is though is let, let let's accept the point of fact that vaccination is about reducing hospitalization should you get the virus again that that's all and again it of course it the virus affects everybody in different ways but what we're concerned about is how it affects vulnerable people and also we want everyone to stay safe so if you have avoided up until now then we want people to stay safe because the 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 the, the, the chances of transmission are still out there and uh, we don't want to be sorry afterwards that's so we hence you know the social distancing masks in certain places etc etc so that's staying safe and staying well in our own interests isn't it whether you've had the vaccination or not so that's really our position as it relates to the whole wellness agenda. So what actions should we be taking to ensure mm, yeah. we stay well anyway, whether we're vaccinated or not? But it's important that we're informed, reassured, and so that we can make a choice. So if we choose not to be vaccinated, how are we going to ensure we stay well? If we've got long COVID now, because I think there's over a million people in this country with long COVID, particularly with mm -hmm. people with underlying conditions of diabetes, hypertension, and maybe on some kind of medication related to cancer and many other things. How are, how are we going to stay well? And we know disproportionately that has impacted our African and Caribbean communities. But today we're talking about Caribbean people 
And we all know from friends and family of all ages now that have been affected, hospitalized, some with long COVID, some unfortunately no longer with us. So whatever there it is, we've got to find a way to stay safe. And of course that also brings us to the diet, nutrition, exercise, sleep, hydration, and doing our best to reduce those other conditions, which in a sense has got to do with our broader mental health and well-being, and mental health in, in particular, of course. So, and that applies whether we're in the community or whether we're in the workforce. It's, it's we're one and the same people and, and COVID also has kind of demonstrated to us that the fragmentation between those of us who work in the health system, health and social care system, uh, being separated from the community has not been a good thing. And that's why no. we, we developed the trusted messengers model that really, you know, the last few uh, uh, months, and you know, with some of the other scientists, pharmacists, uh, GPs and doctors and, you know, psychologists from our communities now, you know, explaining very carefully what they can do for the community. And in fact, one of the dialogues that we'll be having coming up uh, over the next three or four weeks will be physiotherapists. I was, I was amazed what the physiotherapists in our own community are doing and have been doing as it relates to, you know, people with some of those conditions. Think of arthritis, think of some of those other people who've been sick and, and now have to you know, recuperate. And so I was really, really pleased to hear the contribution our community is making. And we'll be having some people on talking about that. Some of our care workers as well. When you, when you listen to them, the challenges, as you can imagine, we have a lot of elders now in the Caribbean community because we've got a low birth rate, as everybody knows. So our, um, so we, we have a lot of people working in social care. We have a lot of our community in care homes now as well. And when you listen to how they're being taken care of as well, you, again, you're, you're amazed. We hear about care workers, but we don't actually understand what they're doing. Sometimes we see some of the, you know, bad stuff on the TV, what happens to people in care homes. But, you know, we, again, we'll have the dialogues with somebody who actually does that every day and we get, or we'll be getting a sense of what they do and the response, you know, from the people they're caring for as well. So we've got some interesting times, dialogues to come up. Um, yeah. So what's happening in Haringey? So in, in Haringey, yes. Uh, um, I'd just like to spend the next few minutes just to end this topic before we go on to uh, a more, a slightly brighter topic, shall I say, and just to give you a snapshot. So in the last seven days, yes, the uh, Haringey uh, they've still been running their their vaccine, their, their bus, the, max, the vaccine bus, and and they've been given advice out as people in terms of ensure. And you have, people have heard this before about fresh air. If you're meeting now that we have, we don't have the <clears throat> restrictions. Still important if if you're let fresh air in. If you're meeting other people um, outdoors is still that's indoors outdoors is still safer and and um i think it's there's still the conditions around um wearing a mask covering when you're in a tube and public places on public transport i think that that's still in place and they're <clears throat> encouraging people about the uh, taking the, the the um the test the lateral flow test i think they're still free aren't they and, uh, as you spoke about uh, earlier on yeah they are they are um you now have to register for them though um, 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. You now have to register to pull them. Um, if you do go to your local pharmacist um, and ask for them, they will ask you to fill in a very simple form. Okay. Okay. So it's just like like a kind of registration. I yeah. think, and, and and also it's also probably the public um, Department of Health or government's way of um, uh, tracing how much um, public or how how much public interaction there is with yeah. the testing. Uh, is the public still test testing and which areas they're testing, you know, in terms of um, which towns, which cities, you know, of, of, to of, try and gather as much data as, as they yeah, can as, yeah. on, on well, the activity. With, with, without, without a doubt. And as you mentioned that, um, one of our community pharmacists, uh, Terry Reed, he, he, we're actually um, working on a community pharmacy awareness day next month at the end of next month where people were able just to drop in it's going to be on a sunday so more details to follow on that they can get information advice and guidance private uh there's private there's a private consultation room as well so any information relating to travel as well because obviously uh travel uh, and the, uh, all the all the issues around travel they're still a bit complicated to people. So over the next few weeks, again, we'll have a, a detailed discussions around travel and some of the protocols as it relates to that. And of course, those of us who travel to the, the Caribbean and have been and want to travel again, we'll be particularly interested in that area. But of course, we'll, we'll be talking about the rest of the world as well. Um, so in terms of the Haringey um, vaccine bus, so the vaccine bus is still continuing its ongoing schedule um, and the mobile clinic is around around Haringey. So you can get your, fir your first, second and booster dose of both uh, Pfizer and Moderna. And of course you can still get the flu vaccine as well for those those people who may not have had their flu vaccine and um where the bus is tomorrow so monday the 14th of february from 9 30 through to 4 p.m it's at the will winkfield resource center 33 winkfield road n22 that's in Wood Green. I think that's near the court, the Crown Court. It's it's in that area of Wood Green. And Thursday, the seventeenth of February, it's at uh, Holly Green, which I think is a cinema, one eighty High Road in Wood Green. That's Thursday, the seventeenth of February, from nine thirty a.m. through to four p.m. And on Friday, the eighteenth of February, it's at the Masjid Mosque which is 115 Clyde Road. That's Tottenham N15. I think that's just somewhere off West Green Road, Clyde Road, somewhere in that area. And then on Friday, the 25th of February, it's at the uh, London Islamic Cultural Centre, which is uh, 289 to 395, white moon road in hornsey so for those members of the community who want to uh, get the jab then um that's where you can that's where you can uh access and if you want to get more information about what's going on in harringay as it relates to that um to the program if you you can just google um, community protect and that will bring up all the information that you need or just haringay.gov.uk and that will bring up the information that, that you you need mm, okay wonderful yeah thank you so thank you thank you thank you i'm very glad that the bus is still going around i think i saw it once yeah um but um and i think initially it was only supposed to be about three months but yeah. it's gone glad, very glad to see it's heading into maybe six seven months now yeah yeah they, they, that's wonderful 
Extent. That really is good. Um, people that need to have the, the vaccine or that have been previously um, reluctant or afraid. Yes. You know, I think that it's through um, through the passage of time and the amount of um, information that's been shared. Um, the uh, They've been able to make uh, a, a, a decision that they feel confident about. Yeah in terms of um, taking either or uh, vaccine. Um, and um, and ho hopefully they're, they're feeling much better, much more confident, you know, much stronger within themselves now that they've, they've got what they feel is a, is a, is a barrier, you know, um, of protection for themselves. And of course, not to mention all, the, all of the healthcare staff who would have also taken taken up the vaccine um, um, over recent months faced with the uh, the prospect of losing their jobs yeah. so that also would have would have pushed up because as we know you know the care workers that you're talking about are in our communities it, you know they're our neighbors there are uh, you know exactly. our, <laughs> our friends our, our families <laughs> friends and neighbors aren't they? Yeah. you know so yeah so the, the final the final area would like to kind of talk about now is around yeah. mental health oh, and some of the work sure. going on at, at the moment so yeah because that's an area that's really suffered that that's an area that's really suffered mm -hmm. um it, it's it's not terribly well i would say it's it's one of it's one of the uh it's one of the areas of healthcare that has always been had special challenges okay of its own, you know, because yeah. of the very complex nature of mental health and the, and the various levels of mental health, uh, uh, um, prescribed and unprescribed. Um, um, and, um, uh, and, and of course, when it comes to our community, there's been so much misdiagnosis of, of, of people of color um, over, the, over the decades. Um, that um, it really does need more um, inclusive um, conversations, uh, more consultation with with um, uh, communities who are. Let me see. What do they use now? Ethnic ethnic minority. The minority yeah, I mean, communities. What I would, what I would yeah, say though, now, that there's been a shift in the. Mm -hmm. There's a recognition as it relates to population groups. Right, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but there's been that policy shift that I think is important mm -hmm. for the workforce to understand as well as the community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When I say the workforce, I'm talking about those of our, our our community who work in mental health as opposed mm -hmm. to an acute trust. It's a it's a whole different area of work. Now, when you look at a mental health, the challenges that are community have had over generations um, also includes the way we ourselves treat people with mental health conditions within our own community based on our cultural dis uh, decisions and things like that uh, not decisions in our cultural ways as well as the challenges that when our community has been in the system how they're also treated by the workforce and the system itself. So that's one thing that is now starting to become clearer. And particularly because of COVID has allowed us to start to think about, so what is it, what is our role within the community ourselves in terms of prevention uh, and early intervention and keeping ourselves out of the system? That's a different agenda, thinking and a way of acting to when we're inside the system, because normally what yeah. happened in the past, it gets conflated. And so we don't get to some of the core um, thinking so that we can we can intervene and change our own behavior within the community and raise awareness within our community about our, our, our the way we treat each other. That's outside as well as inside the system so in what, terms of in terms of mental health yeah how we treat gonna, each other I'm, in terms of mental health yeah in terms of the yeah the way we treat each other so there's a program i'm involved in it's called pcreft and it's it's 
It's called the Patient, Ca Patient Carers Race Equality Framework. And there's, um, it's an NHS England uh, initiative. There's four pilots. So there's mm -hmm. Manchester mm -hmm. for the North, Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health Trust, which I'm involved with that one. But in London, you also have uh, SLAM in South London and Croydon as well. But the yeah, there's other... kind of covering Southwest London, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. But the other trusts, even though they're not, they're not pilot sites as such, they're still aligning with some of the evidence and themes and the way of working from the PCREF. I think they have to. I think that that's something that they will have to do because yeah. this is a pilot that's being it, rolled out. It, it, exactly. They're very much about providing the evidence to inform whether it should be rolled out and how it yeah. should be rolled yeah. out. So whatever yes. issues that are raised through this um, pilot um, scheme that they're rolling out at the moment is going to inform and shape the process should they should they choose to actually roll it out it, it, you know, it, as a service going forward it, exactly exactly you're right and and even if they adapt some of the ideas as well as they emerge so i wanted to just to give you uh, a sense of what what we've been doing because this approach we're also going to be applying to to haringey and the North East London as part of our activities in the area. So I'm taking, we're taking the, the lessons learned and the, the approaches uh, from the pilot and then applying them locally, which again. Mm, that's, that's, that's good, that's good. Hopefully, yeah, yeah hopefully. But, uh, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was say, so let me take you through that quick quickly. So, uh, how we've approached this then, I learned a while ago from somebody from our community, Althea, uh, her name is, she runs a mental health program in Wolverhampton, um, very, very successful for our community. And she, she said to me once, Rudy, in order to get the best outcomes in the mental health, as it relates to mental health, so that's mental health for our community, regardless of whether we're in the community, in our church, in our family, or actually in the mental health system itself. It's to treat people with love, compassion, and with humanity. So I've always remembered those three words, love, compassion, and humanity. So with our program that I'm facilitating then, it's, um, we call it Alpha Connect, First Connect. So there are, there are four key questions that we have, we ask ourselves in our community. So what are the mental well-being challenges that the community solves for itself? What actions need to be taken to improve the feeling of community well-being? What are your ideas for improving the quality of services provided by the community for its well-being? Tell us what you think are the best ways for, for improving access to its own. Yeah, we're not hearing you. We didn't hear any of that. Really? Um, you, your signal dropped completely. Yeah, if you could okay. just run back over those uh, again, that'd be wonderful. Okay. Thank you. So can you hear me now? Am I okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So there are four basic community questions, questions for ourselves as a community. And again, that's on the basis of our workforce and our community, because they're one and the same thing. And the, the questions are, what are the mental well-being challenges that the community solves for itself? What actions need to be taken to improve the feeling of community well-being? What are your ideas for improving the quality of services provided by the community for its well-being? And, and tell us what you think are the best ways for improving access to its own community well-being services. So th these are being delivered through learning sets and workshops and forums. So it is, again, it's a, it's a dialogue. 
And then we have two questions for the system itself. So those four questions are about us, our responsibility, friends, families, communities, churches, mosques, even if we don't go to any any particular um, uh, uh, organized faith or religion. So there's two key questions that we also ask about the system itself. What else should mental health services be doing to improve access, experience? Your signals, your signals, your signal keeps has dropped out there again. I don't know if you right. want to just do a quick refresh um for okay, a second let's see if, okay do a quick refresh um i'll just let the listeners know as we're talking about the midlands at the moment um an organization that is doing some great work up there khan um has a black health improvement program which is currently running and they're doing one for general practice which is um including maternal issues uh, those of you who have been um, going through the maternal process um, through, the, through the pandemic will be well aware of the issues around a pregnancy and uh, the vaccination um, and, and the impact that the, that the virus, that COVID, um, COVID in, which, in whichever form, Omicron, whatever, Delta, has on, on pregnancy. Um, and also the other um, issues around women um, things like endometriosis and, and stuff like that, um, cervical cancers and whatnot. So they're also cover, covering cardiovascular, the cancers, and in, including mental health. So the Black Health Improvement Programme is an opportunity for general practice to better engage with their Black community by understanding their cultural and also their religious beliefs, okay? So they've got something taking place in Greater Manchester, um, and they're also including the social care partnership as well. And um, it's a training session that they're running um, in February. And if you want to find out more, you can just email the Black Health um, Improvement Program, that's B H I P, Black Health Improvement Program, at CAHN, that's C A H N dot org dot UK. That's B H I P, the Black Health improvement program bhip at c a h n khan yeah c a h n dot org dot uk to find out more and book yourself onto one of those training sessions okay and, and become better informed this is what what it's all about yeah getting yourself the information that you need so that you're better informed in order to make better decisions not only for yourself but for your family as well and um, that's why we that's why we're bringing these conversations. That's why we're linking with these various organizations to make sure that the information is shared. Of course, the training will be online, so you don't have to travel to Manchester. <laughs> you don't have to travel. Yeah, you can just sit at home and just listen in. OK, it doesn't usually doesn't cost anything for online events. Um, you can just as long as you've got an Internet um, signal, as long as you've got Wi-Fi on your phone or, or on your computer, or your tablet, you can just listen in. Okay. Rudy, Rudy, have you refreshed? Right. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's all good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, yes, and that's great advice. So, as you can see now, there's more information circulating around the community. So, we've got to find a way to improve our involvement within the system. So, that will take a mindset shift to access the opportunities and the pathways that do exist within the system. This is very different to pre-COVID pre, uh, era. So there's two, two, two other, there's two questions about the system itself. So what else should mental health services be doing to improve access, experience and outcomes to address issues of over-representation, disproportionality and vulnerability? And then also, when have you seen or experienced positive practice? So, um, so what we've done, some small group meetings, and, and um, we've had, what's important to us are the setting. So we've done the setting in a barber shop, a hair salon. Uh, we've done men's faith group. And, and 
community dialogues online as well with church, business and young people. Also, we've done a, a, a focus group, a women's focus group as well. And we're about to do one on what we call reggae wellness group as well, because you know we're in reggae month. And of course, reggae has uh, always played an important part in terms of our, our health, in terms of, you know, our spiritual, spiritual health as well. So we're going to be having a dialogue with some dialogues with some artists, as well as people talking about their, you know, how uh, reggae has been important to them. So, um, so just to give you a quick uh, overview of some of the emerging themes um, coming through access and accountability for quality improvement that should be measured. Um, improving community understanding of diagnosis and medication. You touched on that earlier on. We do need to know more. So we do need our community to get involved. And when they hear of these types of activities and forums taking place, that they do involve themselves again, so that they can be informed, reassured, so that they can make their choices for themselves and their families. This is really important. And that we're saying what's coming through, there should be population based commissioning. So what that means really is that if you look at the Caribbean community now, we're a small, we're a smaller group, as mentioned earlier on, we're spread out around the towns and cities around this country now. So you, you can no longer just, you know, identify one location and say, right, that's where all the Caribbean people are living in that local area. So all funding and support should be directed to that area. That's not the case anymore. So that locality type funding arrangement that still goes on in many areas doesn't apply to the Caribbean population group. So we need to have a better focus on the data in terms of where people are living. What are the organizations that are representing the community? Professional collaboration. We've touched on that. These are our trusted messengers. And, uh, you know, we also have subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. but also, we have people who've, who, who've lived with the lived experience. So they're experts because they've been in the system. They understand it. But they've taken care of family members as well. So their voice is as important as the professionals. And then also what we have to look at, what the term is used, intersectionality. And of course, the Caribbean community is no different in that we have different levels of social, social education and economic circumstances. So again, it's not one size fits all within the Caribbean community. You know, um, there's a difference there and that should be taken into consideration. Mm, that's really interesting. I just wanted to mention something as well. Um, there's an opportunity that's coming up. It's actually closing tomorrow at 8 p.m. in the evening. So it's a great, it's, it's, we've still got time or you've still got time if you want to um, apply. If you are between the age of 16 and 18, if you're of black or mixed heritage, um, then, and you feel that you, you deserve a, a second chance, then there's a, a project taking place um, on the 17th of February, which is during the half term. It's actually with Goldman Sachs. Yeah, oh, and yes. Goldman Sachs yeah. and yeah. Hogan Labelles yes. and also a Mentivity. Yeah, so it's the three of them coming together. And um, it's called the Imani, sorry, Amani project. Yeah, Amani means peace. It's actually a Swahili. Mm. A yeah. word and it means hope in Arab Arabic but the project is seeking 16 to 18 year olds um, of black or mixed heritage who feel that they deserve a second chance yeah so um if you've um um and what's happening here um is that is that the applicants will be paired with a professional mentor yeah, yeah so if you've heard about mentoring i'm sure you have i don't need to go into the backgrounds of it um but they'll be providing you with a professional mentor and um, and and you'll be you'll be taking part in a guided process of learning through a series of 
I think they're really inspiring what I call soft skills and yes. employability workshops. And it's a six yeah. month program. Okay. So, um, so get is that the one the before you go on, is that the mm. one about second chance as well? So people should, well, yeah, worry yeah. If, if, they, if, if you they are, haven't had things perfect, don't worry about it. Is there's yeah. no judgment. So people shouldn't be concerned about that. I think that's yeah, absolutely, point. absolutely. And it's six months and it's it closes tomorrow at 8 p.m. Mm. So if you want to apply, okay, then there's a website that you need to go to where you can either search Google for the Armani project. Right. Project that's A M A N I. So Armani, A M A N I. It's called the Armani project. Just search for it, okay? It's within a site called the Aviard. Yeah aviard.co.uk deadlines tomorrow at 8 p.m so you've got the rest of today and all day tomorrow to take a look at it and you know fill in the application form have it or, or have, a, have a word with the young ones and uh, see if they want to take part okay um right. do not take rejection as something that is um that means that you don't progress any further in exactly. that thing that you desire yeah, rejection is something that's going to happen throughout your lifetime, throughout our all lifetimes. Well, we okay, all, and it's something we all have. It's exactly as really saying, you know, it's something that we all, everybody, has to learn to deal with. Okay, and it's always going to come up. So um, don't see it as as a as we don't do not see rejection as a stopping point for you, on your road to prog of progression. OK, um, it's just um, it's just a barrier. It's just a, a, a hurdle. OK, you can get over it and you, you can, can get jump. through it. You can get over, you can get through, you can get round it and you can get under it as well. There are lots of ways to remove these barriers and obstacles and to and to overcome them. OK, this is an opportunity for you. OK, if you are 16 to 18 years old, the Amani, A-M-A-N-I, Amani project, okay, which closes tomorrow at um, at eight p.m. Okay, Goldman Sachs, um, Lavelle's, they are auditors. Um, they work in the corporate sector. So if that's an area that that you're interested in, either the legal sector or the corporate sector around auditing, um, mergers and acquisitions, that kind of thing, big money pro programs, hedge funds, and all of that kind of stuff, um, then get in touch. Okay, and all the best to you. Mm. There's Sorry, another, Rudy. yeah. There's another great program for Haringey, and this is London's Elite Haringey Youth Positive Spare Time School Holiday Project. So that's from the 16th to the 18th of February, 12 p.m. through to 3:30 p.m. That's Bradley's Boot Camp, and that's actually going to take place at the Broadwater Farm. Uh, community center so there's gym badminton table tennis and much more you can call jude on 07961 731714 that's 07961 731714 so you can always ring broadwater farm community center Adams Road, M17, local people will know where that is anyway, and ask for Bradley's Boot Camp, and that's for 14, 14 years old and over, mm. both, both male and female. So families, you know, the opportunity to get fit with great exercises. They talk about coordination, respect, concentration, cooperation, fitness, and direction. So again, that's about the mental and physical well-being of the of, of the individual. So there's going to be lots around teamwork in there as well. And of course, building friendships, of course, as we know that that's important to build friendships in the neighborhoods in where we all live. Mm. And talking about neighbourhoods, mm. the Hackney, um, the Hackney Haggerston schoolboy, um, Arlen, Arlen Cameron, who's just right. 15 years old and won a 44,000 um, scholarship 
So well done to um, to Arlen. If I'd have if I'd have um, been on last week, I would have mm. I should sent sent a shout out then. But um, uh, it's a it's a top top fee paying school that he has won this money for, and I'm so so pleased for him. It's a it's a real achievement. Now he's just 15 years old. Yeah. Now if he had thought, do you know what, I'm never going to have a chance of getting this, and yeah. he didn't do it, and he didn't make that application. Yeah, he would have never have won this money and he would never have been um, given the. Can you imagine the boost of encouragement that he's got? Exactly. Yeah, do you ma imagine the boost of pride that yeah. he has, and he's you know, an and, and the confidence in his abilities. Yeah. Yes. He's set an example for his peers so that his peers know and the and the, those young people younger than himself, he now becomes a role model. So that they can look at him and say, well, OK, I could do that in three years time, four years time, because those young people may be five or six years younger than him. And of course, they're the ones that we, we've got to influence now. Again, this pandemic era where we are now, we, we, we've been talking about shaping our future. So now we talk about how are we going to get the 10 year old to understand? how the world is in terms of mm. what they're going to meet. Mm -hmm. so, so we're now thinking about the 22nd century, if you think mm -hmm. about it. Absolutely, absolutely. We I'm have to have bird. 22nd century thinking. Yes. And we'll be running some, we're running a, a round table on that on the 26th of April. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for us to think, well, what would, what, do we think the 22nd mm -hmm. century will look like? Because we now have 10 year olds that when they get to our age, they'll be thinking about their grandchildren as mm -hmm. the 22nd century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, oh, oh yeah, I'm looking at the future. I mean, we were gonna talk about ecotourism yeah. during this last set today, but um, we haven't been able to squeeze that in. Yeah. But um, uh, it, the future of, of ourselves, you know, exactly. our lives, you know, exactly. um, that the, 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 when we reach the silver tone years oh, and our children right. are in their thirties and, and right. parents of their own, you know, and the, and our, our grandchildren now, you know, what is the future yes. looking like for them, you know, and not looking at what, I mean, it's two tone, yeah? There's yeah. Two, two main sides to it, I think. And that is, what does the society, what does the country's future look like, exactly. the country look like for them in terms of their future and how they fit into the societies, you know, the services that yeah. we've spoken about yeah. today, the healthcare services, not only from an employment point of view, but also from a patient point of view, you know, if they have to access those services, which Absolutely. is something that we speak about quite a lot here, yeah. you know, what, where is it going to cost them money? I mean, there's a lot of talk about privatising the NHS service here, and I, for one, think that it is eminent. It is something of, that's of course, but, but also um, now, it's also now. And then like, how do we pay? Yeah, but also now it's where we decide to live. Absolutely, and that's what you I was know, getting we, to. We can live, we can live anywhere we choose, you know. Some of us want to go homeward bound to where our great great grandparents came from. So we made this. Yeah, but there's or there are also back. risks. But there are risks with that as well because Everywhere. of the societies, because of society, because of economy. You know, there are also risks with even returning to the Caribbean or to Africa because yeah. of the 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 poverty in the in the areas um, in well, these countries and yeah. and also the way that society those communities mm. face. <laughs> You know, they look upon us True. as people but, returning. But we, have to, we have to be careful, though, because our yeah. experience here in the UK. Oh, is, my goodness. Oh, we're Windrush we're wind 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 generation, so yeah. to know about. But anyway, very quickly before we go, I just want to mention about the free food every Friday in February, 2 till 4 p.m. This is in Frinsbury Park next door to the little shopping center right by the finsbury park station there food uh free food every friday in february two till four they need volunteers they also need food donations so if you know anybody who needs help or you, if you can give help either by donating food or your time then you contact uh 
from Rehab to Life Foundation. And as I said, that they are based Finsbury Park, in Finsbury Park, next door to Lidl Shopping Centre, every Friday in February, two till four. Wonderful. Free food. And on that note, I look Brilliant. forward to our next Thank you. dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you so much. Um, what, what is uh, Rudy Page now? What is? Let me just have a look at my schedule here, because I know we've got another one coming up. I think it's it's next month, but it might be in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, I, I think have it's a the look and see end what of is the this month. So I think it's probably the last Sunday of this month. Probably, I'm pretty sure it is. Do you think so? Yeah, let, let me double check because there were some challenges on that. I'm just, that, that, yeah, I'm just having a look at my schedule. Sorry about the date. I've got the 28th. I've got yeah. the 28th of February. Yeah, so it's the, the last Sunday, which is actually the 27th. Hmm. That's Can what you I've send me an updated flyer? Yeah, yes. yeah. Because my flyer says the 28th. Yeah, yeah, the 28th. Yeah, the 28th just review all those dates, the ones in March and April. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, and and send it and send it back, and then we can um I, I can post that out and let people know so that they can they yeah. can tune in. Um, and and regarding yeah my involvement on these um on these panels, do send me the details. Yeah. Okay, we'll discuss Thanks. all that later. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Rudy Page, right. MCW. A tremendous work again. And uh, yeah, keep it up. And we look forward to seeing you on the 27th of February, right here on Real Talk Reasonings. Okay, have, have a great Sunday. Look after yourself and your loved ones. Yeah, and remember, be informed. Okay, be informed. Take care now. Stay well. Bye. Bye, Rudy.